Hi, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good day today. Today, we're going to talk about the envelope theorem. Now, the envelope theorem, you'll recall that uh, in an early lecture, we talked about the solution function and the value function for a maximization or a minimization problem. And the envelope theorem is going to tell us about the value function, I'm going to give us information about the value function for a maximization problem. So let's start right in with a, a, simple, uh, a simple example from basically from undergraduate economics. And so what we're going to look at is a price taking firm. So let's say we have a firm that is going to uh, maximize it's profit. Profit depends on the quantity that the firm produces and wants to sell, and also on the market price. And this is a price-taking firm, which means that this firm, by selling more or less quantity, will not have any effect on the price. It takes the price as parametric. And then chooses the quantity that will maximize profit given that price. So we're maximizing uh, over all the Q's in R plus. And so the profit function, of course, is just profit, of course, is just revenue minus cost by definition. And so revenue, that's going to be price times quantity. And then we've got minus the cost associated with producing a given level of output. And I'm actually going to uh, put in a specific cost function here rather than a general cost function because it'll make it, everything go a little more transparently. And so let's say this uh, cost function is C times Q squared. And so the fact that the cost function is convex, strictly convex, Q squared uh, is kind of an element that makes the, the example go through nicely. And so uh, what the firm is going to do then is it's going to choose uh, the quantity that, uh, that maximizes profit. That's going to be uh, the quantity that, that uh, satisfies the first order condition. And that's going to be derivative of profit with respect to Q is zero. And that says the marginal revenue minus the marginal cost is zero because, as I said, profit is just revenue minus cost by definition. And so the derivative of profit is the derivative of the revenue function minus the derivative of the cost function. That's zero. And of course, we often write that as marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So I'll write it that way here. And uh, we'll notice that uh, marginal revenue here is just uh, P and the price. And marginal cost in our, our specific cost function here is 2 times C times Q. And so this firm's decision, the firm's choice of quantity, or the firm's uh, decision function or solution function is going to be that the optimum quantity is going to be, well, if marginal revenue equals marginal cost, then 2CQ equals P, so Q equals P over 2C, so this is P over 2C. That's the solution function. Let's write that here. That's the solution function for our, our maximization problem. And actually notice that the profit function is strictly concave. So uh, if we want to take into account the second order condition, uh, that'll be OK too. So here's our solution function. And now what I want to know is what's going to happen to the level of profit, to the amount of profit, 
if the parameter, if the variable that defines the environment that the firm is facing, the price in the market, if that changes. Remember, the firm can't change that price itself. The firm just takes the market price as, as given, uh, but that can change. And so we want to know what happens if this parameter or environmental variable changes, how is that going to affect the profit? And that's the question that the envelope theorem is going to help us with. Well, uh, you might say that, look, if the price goes up by a dollar, let's say, uh, then profit is going to increase by a dollar on every unit that's sold. So the profit will increase by Q dollars. Price goes up by half a dollar, profit will go up by a half Q dollars. So the first uh, pass at this is probably to say that the change in profit is going to be likely to be Q times the change in price or change in profit by change in price is Q. Well, that, notice that that can't quite be correct. That can't quite be right because it's certainly the case that uh, if the price goes up by a dollar, we will uh, earn an additional revenue of a dollar for every unit that we're selling so the profit will go up by Q dollars, but the uh, decision, the quantity the firm produces is going to change in response to that change in price. So we're going to have an additional increase in profit because the quantity is going to go up by, if P is a dollar, by 1 over 2C, and that's going to increase by 1 over 2C, and that's going to increase by 1 over 2C. So the change in profit, this can't quite be right. So let's, uh, let's check that. Let's look, for example, at, well, it's the value function that tells us the value of the objective function in our optimization problem as a function of the parameter. So let's write here that the value function um, is uh, is pi of q hat of p, let's, q hat of p and p. And with a simple function, we can actually work with that, work out what that is explicitly. Uh, but for now, let's just point out then that what we're interested in is the derivative of the value function. I want to know how much the profit's going to change when I change P. And while I could work that out arithmetically, algebraically, exactly, and I'm going to ask you to do that in a moment, uh, but let's see what we can do with the derivative. See what the derivative will tell us and see how far we can get with that. So that's going to be the derivative of uh, pi with respect to p, and so that's q. That's just the derivative of pi with respect to p, and that's the same thing we have over here, that the amount of profit's going to change by the amount q, but we also have to take into account that the We also have to take into account the fact that the Q is going to change when we change P. And that's what this term here does. It tells us how much Q will change, the derivative, so approximation, and then how much profit will change as a function of changing the quantity. Well, we already know what this is. Let's uh, use a different color here. We know that this is uh, 1 over 2C. Derivative of this function with respect to P is 1 over 2C. So indeed, output's going to change, going to increase. 
And what about this? The derivative of pi with respect to q, that's zero. So this is zero. So in fact, it turns out that the derivative uh, of the value function with respect to p is just q. So our first pass at this actually was correct. So what we find then is that the derivative of the value function, which tells us how the profit changes when we change the parameter p, that gives us a sort of first level approximation, if you like, linear approximation, to the actual change. We said that the actual change can't be exactly q. It has to be something, in this case, a little bigger than q. But it's apparently not much bigger because the derivative gives us this first level or linear approximation of exactly q uh, as our estimate of how much the profit's going to change. So uh, let me note one more uh, thing here that kind of uh, uh, gives some additional intuition here. Notice that uh, if we have marginal revenue equal to marginal cost at the optimum uh, here, then when we change the quantity in response to the change in price, in this case 1 over 2c, how much will the revenue and how much will the cost change? Well, there will be some change in revenue, that will actually increase. There will be some change in cost, that will actually increase as well. And since at the optimal quantity, marginal revenue equals marginal cost, the change that takes place in revenue and the change that takes place in cost are almost exactly going to offset one another, which is another way of seeing that this term here has to drop out in the derivative. And if we're looking at the exact change, uh, the, the additional part of the change is going to be small. So here I think it might be worthwhile. I'm not going to go through this myself in detail, but I'll suggest you do this. So I would say try doing this for, let's say, c equals, let's say for c equals uh, 1 over 20. And start out with a price of $100. See what happens in terms of, uh, let's say, try a change in price of a dollar. Try a change in price of, let's say, half a dollar. And see what happens to the actual change in quantity in both cases. And then see what you get, uh, sorry, the actual change in profit. And then see what you get by applying uh, V prime of P times the change in Q. Uh, that should be times the change in, in P. Okay. And compare them. And you will see that the, the actual change is not this, but it's very close. The, very close to the, what you'll get as an estimate by using the, the derivative from the value function. So the key here is that we're using the value function to tell us how profit responds to change in parameter, and we want to be able to know about the derivative of the, profit, of the value function. And that derivative turned out here to be q, which was exactly the partial derivative of pi with respect to p. Just the partial derivative of pi with respect to p, uh, with, with respect to p, which is q. So that is the envelope theorem. <laughs> in, a, in a nutshell, in the simplest possible example, this is the envelope theorem. Okay, so what we want to do now is uh, we want to, starting from our example, we want to now give a formal statement of the envelope theorem, and we want to give a statement that will be 
much more general than what we have over here, where we just had one parameter and uh, one decision variable. So we're going to state the, uh, the envelope theorem, ultimately, for an arbitrary number of parameters, arbitrary number of variables, not necessarily the same number, and for problems uh, of constrained optimization, problems uh, uh, with constraints. But we're going to start with the statement of the envelope theorem for, again, just one variable and one parameter. So let's get started. Let's uh, say we're going to uh, assume that we have uh, our space of uh, decision, uh, decision possibilities uh, and we have our space of parameter values and we're starting off again as in the example with both of these as subsets of the real number. So just one dimensional parameter and one dimensional decision space. So we're assuming that the, the two sets are open sets. You can think of them as open intervals in the real line. Uh, and then we have our objective function that's going to be maximized. That's a function from the product of the decision space and the parameter space into the real. So it's a real value function uh, that we're going to maximize. We want to assume that that is continuously differentiable function and uh, we're going to assume that the solution function for our problem, the decision function maps, of course, from the parameter space into the decision space. So this is the solution function for the problem to maximize uh, our objective function. and I'll use a semicolon in general to separate the decision variables from the parameters. So the solution function for this problem is a differentiable function. So that's the assumptions of our envelope theorem. And the conclusion, not surprisingly given our example over here, the conclusion is going to be that the derivative of the value function is just the partial derivative of the objective function with respect to the parameter. And now let's put here uh, that this, let's point out that this is the value function. We'll write down its definition for, because uh, we'll use that as a reference here. So that's going to be of course, defined to be the objective function evaluated at the decision, the value of the solution function, and parameter. So that's, that's the envelope theorem. Simple, simple conclusion, a simple setting really. We're just, we just have an optimization problem here, uh, and uh, a simple conclusion about the derivative of the value function. Uh, let's note that this is uh, exactly fitting with our example, or maybe a better way to put it is that the example is a fitting application of the envelope theorem, even in this simple one-by-one -one, uh, framework. The uh, quantity that the firm is choosing, its decision about quantity, plays the role of the x over here. The price that the firm faces takes as given, as param parametric in the marketplace, plays the role of the theta, and of course the profit function 
plays the role of the objective function f over here. And, and also notice that uh, with uh, identifying what variables here play the roles of the items over here, we can see that the conclusion here is indeed exactly the same as the conclusion over here. So let's see about a proof. And of course, in this one by one problem, one parameter, one decision variable, the proof is really going to be the same as the proof that we already gave, but we'll do it in the notation that we'll typically see for the envelope theorem and, of course, also the notation that, the notation that we're now going to use to uh, generalize the theorem to multiple parameters, multiple variables, constraints, and so on. So the proof, then, is that uh, the derivative of the value function is just the derivative of this function with respect to theta. So it is the partial of f with respect to the first variable, partial of f with respect to x, sorry, with respect to theta. I mean, it is, we do have the first variable in there, but I don't want to write that first, so let's take this out. And this is the partial with respect to theta plus the partial now with respect to the x variable times the partial of that x variable, or the partial of the solution function, with respect to the parameter. So that's uh, simple. Derivative of the, this v function with respect to the, the theta variable, the parameter. But then notice that, as we did over here, that since uh, the solution function always has the decision variable x maximizing the objective function, that's the definition of the solution function, it's always going to be the case that the derivative of the objective function with respect to the decision variable is going to be zero. That's the first order condition for, uh, for our uh, maximization problem. So let's just put in here that this is zero and that's the first order condition for the maximization problem. And since that's zero, that means this whole term is zero. And that means that I almost wrote zero there, but this is actually then the partial derivative of f with respect to theta only. So that as before in the example, it turns out that the uh, effect of the parameter of parameter changes on the objective function is completely summarized in the derivative, is completely summarized by just the direct effect of the parameter change on the objective function. And the, this theorem enables us to ignore the indirect effect of the parameter change through its effect on the decision variable, just like in the example. And so that's the proof. That's it. <laughs> There's nothing more to do here. Okay, so now the next thing we do want to do is we want to say, well, what about the situation with more parameters and or more decision variables? So, for example, suppose that the, the firm here um, is a multi-product firm, produces multiple products. So the uh, Q is now a vector with the levels of production of the various products the firm produces, and it needs to decide on the levels of all those products. And then suppose the P is also a vector of those products' prices, and the firm is a price taker, so it's taking those prices as given, their parameters, and there I would have both the number of parameters and the number of variables would be the same, but there may be additional parameters. There might be parameters associated with the cost function, um, so there could be more parameters than uh, decision variables, and there could be fewer. They don't have to be the same number. And so we want to do that over here. And so instead of rewriting everything, we just have to change, just tweak a couple little things here. So we'll say, suppose there are n decision variables, and there are m parameters. 
Nothing else needs to change here. Of course, the dimensions of these spaces are now different, but the notation's the same. That's not a problem. Um, the one place where things have to change is down here, because now we have multiple parameters, and we're going to be looking at the uh, derivative of the value function with respect to, of course, one of the parameters. So let's just cross this out and replace it with the derivative of the value function with respect to parameter uh, theta i. And that means that over here, that's going to be uh, the derivative of f with respect to theta i. So this now is the conclusion of the theorem. It's still the case that we're looking at the derivative of the value function with respect to a parameter, but it's one of the several parameters. This, is, of course, is defined the same way. Here, I need to do the same thing that I did here. And in fact, down here, let me just, instead of crossing it out, let's just erase this and replace it with partial of v with respect to theta i. So this is going to be theta sub i. And in the end, we're going to get theta sub i over here, of course. And so this is going to be, well, so I need to, this is still the same. But this term now has to include all n of the x variables. So I need to replace this with the sum j equals 1 to n uh, partial of f with respect to x j partial of x hat with respect to theta i. So this runs over all the j's from 1 to n because it's all the decision variables, but it's still only just theta sub i because we're taking the derivative with respect to that specific parameter. And now, uh, notice that the same thing happens as happened here when we replace this with this sum. It's now the case that that element in the sum for every j is equal to zero. And that's again just as here because the first order condition says that the gradient of f uh, has to be the zero vector. That is, every one of the partial derivatives of f with respect to x, the xj's, will be zero. So every one of these uh, elements here is zero, and so that means the whole sum is going to be zero. So that means, well, I've written that that's equal to zero, but then that means that this whole sum is equal to zero. And so if I replace this with this sum and it's equal to zero, it's still the case that the derivative is equal to the derivative of f with respect to theta i. This drops out, so this is still the same, although I did have to put the sub i on here because we're talking about a specific parameter. So that completes the proof. We've just replaced this term with this term that's a sum, but it's also zero. So that really takes care of the envelope theorem when there are no constraints. Arbitrary number of parameters, arbitrary number of variables, and we could apply that over here. And in fact, we could even say, I could have now changed this example to say, we have a multi-product firm. Uh, let's look at all the prices. A firm's a price taker. That's a, that's a critical assumption in the example. The firm's a price taker, so the prices are actually parameters from the firm's point of view. And we would end up with the derivative of the profit function with respect to any one of the prices, the parameters, would simply be the derivative of the profit function with respect to that particular price, and it would be Q sub J derivative of the profit function with respect to p sub j would be the quantity q sub j. That would just be a consequence of the, the envelope theorem here, but of course we could have 
prove that directly in that one by one, well, in, even in this case. So now we have the envelope theorem for arbitrary number of parameters and variables. Now we want to see what happens um, if we have a constraint problem, if we add a constraint. So let's take our example off here. We'll take a moment to get the example off, and then we'll come back and we'll look at what happens uh, if we have a constraint problem.